So the first thing I'm going to say is I'm a Cornishman. I worked for a company that was 79% South African. That was the, the software as a service company. And I did my PhD in Canada. So if you can't understand my accent, I'm sorry that we don't have uh, subtitles available today. Um, the, the thing I'm going to say before I show you the, the top sort of four or five findings from uh, the report is something that's very fundamental. Um, there was a question asked earlier about public sector organisations. So I've worked in two very different organisations recently. So one of which was a software as a service company. I started as employee number seven. When I left, we had 750 employees. We had 59 countries of operations, 11 data centers, 56,000 servers. We were growing at 7,500% growth year on year. Managing security in an environment like that is very different than managing it in a very large bank, in fact, the largest bank in the world. So I was having a conversation with someone online. Uh, they were from a public sector organization, and they were telling me, I have no idea of the scale that they work on. And I'm like, well, tell me then. They go, well, we do 56 billion in payments to customers every year. We have 35 million customers. And I'm like, OK, uh, so the company I work for, uh, we operate in 69 countries, and we have 500 regulators because we were a broad spectrum financial services organization. So we worked in every financial product there was, from credit cards, retail banking, to IPOs. And I had one system, highly available, obviously, but it was processing 60 billion a day dollars, right? And that was 25% of all US uh, dollar transactions in the globe. The problems we face are the same. The problems I faced were the same. And there were certain fundamental aspects which, if I hadn't done them in the software as a service company, or if I hadn't done them in the bank, we would not have been successful. And one of the things that will be borne out in these results is we keep buying products without sorting the fundamentals out. And that is a challenge. There are lots of vendors, including the one I work for here today. Uh, but what I do is I don't sell product. I build security operations capabilities using products, some of which aren't micro-focus products. So the organization I work for, we build security operations capabilities for customers on a broad spectrum of different products. And guess what? Technology is the least important thing. Technology is a force multiplier. But if the force you're applying is wrong, then you're going to apply multiplied wrong force. And there's going to be uh, a couple of topics around hunting and around machine learning uh, in my presentation today. These are the new sexy. This is what everyone wants. But sometimes we haven't got the fundamentals right in order to apply those. So the organization that I work for, we build security operations capabilities. That's what we do. We built that for 75 customers uh, end to end. So if you think customers like Apple, Microsoft, American Airlines, DHL, we also get involved after breaches in building security operations capabilities because the customers didn't detect the breach and they suddenly discover that they should have been able to. So companies like Sony, Target, Home Depot, uh, and also uh, more recently um, uh, a couple of others that have been in news that are non-referenceable. But one of the things we do with these SOC assessments, and that's what I'm going to talk about the results of today. So we're a very small team, 60 of us. Uh, and, but between the 60 of us, we have about 275 years of experience in operations. All of us have been behind a console. All of us have been in incident response and investigation. There's not a single person on the team. So I'm not going to go into the salesy bit at the bottom of the slide, because I want to get into the meat of it. The reality is, this is the assessments that we, we've done, the different countries that we've done those assessments. And what we do in these assessments is we look at about 168 different areas of people, process, technology, business alignment. Where do you get your analysts? How do you train your analysts? How do you skills assess them? How do you triage events? How do you prioritize events? How do you build the content for detection? How do you integrate uh, threat intelligence? How do you retain your analysts? Where do your analysts go when they leave? All of these kinds of questions. 
and we give a CMMI uh, score, so between zero and five. Uh, we target three uh, for customers, try and get them to achieve three, because four and five, unless you're a managed service provider, is very stodgy, very slow. Uh, and it means you don't have the agility to react at the speed of which our adversaries are changing. So what we actually find, though, is when we take the aggregate score of all of those different areas, we're finding that 82% of the SOCs are not even reaching a CMMI level of one. Right? That is, they are uh, spending an awful lot of money. They're not even doing something undocumented and, and it's ad hoc. They're not even achieving that. They're just spending an awful lot of money on tools and people and not achieving even a base level capability of detecting anything. So the other thing that, uh, that we're finding is GDPR. Right? GDPR has been heavily driven by privacy. And the, the DPOs and the data protection officers are driving it. And they make this assumption that we're spending hundreds or tens of millions a year uh, for large organizations on a security operations center. Therefore, the ability to detect, respond, and investigate incidents in 72 hours, which is the GDPR requirement, is, is handled. You know, it's almost the tick in the box. We've got a SOC. We know they're doing this. The reality is, looking at these results, they're not. And if you look at the average time to investigate an incident, it's actually 960 hours. It's 40 days. And GDPR gives us 72 hours to do this. So most organizations are not ready for doing that. And the reason for it is not because of tools or lack of people, which is the excuse we keep making. CapEx is relatively easy to get. OpEx is more difficult to, uh, to prove. But the reality is there's fundamentals, like aligning to risk in the organization, understanding your assets, um, actually being integrated in IT operational processes rather than going head to head with the IT ops department. These are the things that uh, drive success. So I'll just give you a little bit of a snippet. This is actually the relative maturity uh, average of all of the different organizations. So you can actually see uh, you know, government is, is fairly low, uh, and, and the question about us moving to e-government services. Uh, one of the reasons for this is IT outsourcing. You know, IT outsourcing contracts changing every two years. Uh, it was mentioned in the last slide. It's a journey, not a destination. And that's exactly what a security operations capability is. It's a business as usual process, not a project. If you complete the project and then stop there, you stop showing value to the business. They stop funding your SOC. You have huge attrition of staff. We've seen this in lots of security operation centers. Uh, and I'm going to talk more about IT outsourcing and managed security service providers later. So let's get into the meat of of the findings. So the first one is uh, Hunt is big this year. Um, and we have automation, replace the people. We find it really hard getting people, so let's replace the people with technology. And I work in uh, an awful lot with SIM platforms. I don't know if any of you use security information event management platforms. Everyone says they don't work. They don't work because you don't model your risk and then put that in the SIM. They're not magical boxes. The vendors sell them as magical boxes. But there are some fundamental things you need to do to be successful with them. And this is what we find now with things like AI and machine learning. They're being sold as magical boxes. So unsupervised machine learning has two problems. The first one is it's actually something that's been around quite a long time. So if you look at the um, security information and event management platforms, uh, like ArcSight, like NetForensics, which is now Black Stratus, QRADO, and things like this, they have a statistical anomaly engine in them. So they trend norms and then look for deviations on a norm. Guess what? That's machine learning. It's actually been around for 16 years before marketing ever managed to get hold of it. Right? So be cautious when you're buying a black box machine learning technology. The other problem with unsupervised machine learning is it produces an awful lot of false positives. And it doesn't tell you why always it's made that determination. I found something. Guess what? If it's found something, you still need a team of analysts to investigate it and understand the context of what's there. It's not going to solve the problem. It's just going to create a different problem. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. And the next thing is hybrid. Hybrid is something we're seeing as really effective if it's managed well. So we have this tradition of in-house security operation centres. Hard to get the skills, hard to retain the skills, even though there are some ways around that. But then we have on the opposite end of the spectrum, managed security service providers. Generic service uh, offered to all customers, not customised to the business. Generally large amount of false positives. What hybrid staffing options are, is where you go out to an IT uh, outsourcing organisation or a specialist provider and they embed staff within your organisations. So we've seen this done really well. We've seen it done really badly as well in some of our customers. But it is solving some of that skill shortage problem. So the top finding is that full automation is not realistic. right? And I, I mentioned a bit about this uh, a minute ago. So we are starting to see an awful lot of people go for hunt, which is where you have people looking at a large quantity of logs looking for anomalous activities, looking for deviations from a norm. Guess what? To do that, you still need to model your threats. The reason why people haven't been successful with SIM is because they couldn't build the correlations to model the threats. So Anton Javokin, one of my ex-colleagues, who's now a Gartner analyst in, um, in SIM, said, if people couldn't be successful with the SIM, there is not a hope in hell. That's not his exact words. Um, but there's not a hope that they are going to be successful with uh, hunting and with uh, machine learning. It's more complex uh, than what we've got at the moment, and a lot of people aren't uh, being successful in that. I'm going to come back to this topic if I get time later. But everyone we've seen who's gone hunt and analytics, it's been because they haven't done the fundamental modelling in order to make correlation work. So the difference between correlation and hunt and analytics is you know the context. If you model your attack vectors, you model attacker behaviour by thinking like a bad guy, it was said earlier, and a lot of SOCs don't employ people who think like bad guys. So let's leverage a relationship with the, uh, the uh, pen testing team to, to build that. So that's more of a process kind of thing. And if you do that, you actually scale better because correlation uh, actually gives you uh, better context because you understand the nature of the attack. Managed services. So managed services on the whole, uh, if you look at a lot of the breaches recently, Talk, Talk, Target, things like that, they all have managed service providers who didn't, weren't the people telling them they'd been breached. You know, it was a third party, law enforcement or something like that. Managed services providers are great for very cheaply handling compliance obligations. So, uh, so we've seen mixed, mixed results with those. So the best thing that we've seen is when people have a maturity curve. They go from log management, they go to correlation. Then they go from correlation to hunt and machine learning analytics. Again, this is something we've been promoting for a very long time, and including this being driven by threat intelligence. And when I say threat intelligence, I don't mean indicators of compromise coming in in a feed. I mean understanding the, um, the adversary behavior, what they are likely to go after, what are their capabilities, the campaigns that are going on, as well as the indicators. And having these fully integrated into your processes, your threat briefings, and the content that runs on the SIM in Hunt and Analytics. Uh, what we've seen is people that are just trying to do hunt, gather all their logs together, they get someone who's done a Coursera course on data science and all of a sudden they have a hunt team. That has never been successful in what we've seen. This is uh, an interesting one. So uh, we've seen one of the most successful socks we've seen is actually a telco uh, in the Middle East and they have their entire SOC staff are from a third party provider, one that, that generally doesn't have a very good name in the industry for the quality of its resources. But because of the way they govern and manage those people, it's been one of the most successful SOCs that we've seen. So it's all about the governance and how you use these people, not throwing it over a wall to an ITO or uh, to a third party organisation to uh, produce bodies. So uh, this is a big one. Public sector, that maturity level is just not going up, right? And this links to the next one as well, because it's not linked 
to spending. Public sector organisations are spending a lot of money, but the most mature socks we've seen, it's not dependent on spending. It's dependent on the skills, the structure, the governance, and the foundations, the risk modelling, and the processes. So that's, that's my alarm. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a red card now. Um, there's a couple more slides where we talk about how do you actually solve these problems, but these are the uh, big takeaways. I'll be on the microfocus stand all day if you want to have a chat about how you actually solve these problems and what we've seen work. I've told you what the problems are and what the findings are, um, but come and grab me uh, later if you'd like some answers. Thanks very much. James.